Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, y'all. Um, hello, welcome. Uh, welcome everyone to this fourth installment of the 2023-2024 lecture series entitled Publicness. Uh, publicness refers to the power of architecture and design to shape our built environment uh, to benefit the society at large. It celebrates conditions of interaction, adaptability, collaboration, spontaneity, and openness. And we're super lucky. Today's lecture is entitled Inside Out, How Na Nature of Place and Experience Are Reshaping Stadiums, and will be led by our very own Huckabee College of Architecture alumnus, Lance Evans. Lance graduated with a Master of Architecture from our college in 2004 before joining HKS's office in Los Angeles. Lance is a venue design director, partner, and principal at HKS. As a designer, he finds inspiration in the unique story of every project and conducts research on the surrounding context of site locations to consider the impact of his projects. His work includes pro baseball and football in collegiate and international venues. He was the lead architect on US Bank Stadium and SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. Having spent time with Lance and the opportunity to learn about his work and path, I believe he, has a, he will have a special resonance with our students and community here at the college, and I greatly look forward to his talk. On that note, I will turn things over to Lance. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. What a trip to be back in Lubbock. It was almost 20 years ago this summer is when I graduated from this place. So a lot has changed uh, since the last time I was here. But some things are always that stay the same. And so I just wanted to start the lecture with maybe some stories from my past, if you'll humor me. Um, this was from Upe Flukiger. I didn't know, I, you know, I wanted to be an architect when I grew up and I was like, oh, I'm gonna design houses. This is what I wanted to do. That is what architecture is. And I came and the first day, the first question, <laughs> And the only thing that was on the wall was this sentence, red is good, but heavy is better. And Professor Flew Keeger and the other dean at the time, Dr. Jones came in and they just said, welcome to architecture. And they got up and they walked out. What the heck are you supposed to do with this? I came to study architecture, I came to study houses. Red is good, heavy is better. I have been searching for the meaning of this for 20 years. I have no clue what it is. So. I asked mid-journey, I typed it in. Red is good, heavy is better. What does it give you? It gives you this, Upe, is that the right answer? Okay, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think AI is quite there yet, but we're still in the try. What a funny story. Second one was I had the chance to study in Sevilla with Professor Aranha. Anybody doing that? Anybody gonna go on a summer abroad in Sevilla, planning on? Oh, great. This was like a life-changing experience for me. Now, I'm from San Antonio, born and raised. I was a proud Texan. I was going to live here my entire life. Like, the world orbited around Texas for me. I went to Sevilla, and my life changed. You know, it broadened my horizons, my perspective, the way that I attack and view our profession. I did some of these doodles around the city, you know, with Professor Ron Honey, and my sketchbook while it was full, it wasn't full enough. And I remember like sitting over there and like trying to draw, which one was it? It was this guy right here. I was like so enamored trying to draw this detail and, and Professor Aranha was like, Lance, why don't you do more? And I was like, well, I just wanted to get it right. I wanna like get the proportions right on the message. And he was like, Lance, you just have to embrace the suck. And I was like, what? Embrace the suck? And he was like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're perfect. What matters is how your hand communicates down on paper your thoughts. So it's not how good you draw, but it's how you're communicating. It's how you're doing it. It's the constant motion of it, curiosity. You showed me some great sketches by Le Corbusier. And if you guys haven't seen him, you should look them up. They're not perfect, but he's communicating a message. And that's what, that's what Joe was teaching me there. Um, this is a quote, anybody know Rick Rubin? Familiar with Rick Rubin? Look him up if you don't know him. Uh, very inspirational to me right now, but I love this quote. Welcome the unexpected, you know, at the end of that. And life is, is full of unexpected twists and turns. So when I was sitting here and everybody was filing in the room, 
Professor Hawk, Saif Hawk, came up to me and said, hello. And there's, there he is right there. He made a founding impact on my life. He pushed me forward. I think he liked my work as a student, I think, Professor. Tell me you did. I think I got good, decent grades in it. And he gave me this thing. He was like, as I was graduating, he was like, hey, whatever you do, just don't go work for an H firm. And I was like, what do you mean? Don't go work for HOK, HKS, HLW, HL, da, 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 da. Like, explore, free your mind. Go. So what did I do? I went and worked. <laughs> I went and worked for HKS. And it was one of the most unexpected and fortunate turn and events of my life. So I had, uh, had my journey throughout Spain. I knew I wanted to explore uh, the country in a way of my profession, architecture and, and creativity. So after graduation, I was either gonna go east to New York City or I was gonna go west to LA. I tried New York and I fell in love. That city is amazing. It is like boom, 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 all the time, the energy. And I loved it. I was like, I'm going to live in New York. That's what I'm going to do. And I was in New York. I came back to Lubbock when I got off the plane. And I don't know how to describe it other than I could breathe again. I got off the plane. And I was like, ah, I was like, whew, I don't know if I could live in New York. So then I was like, all right, I'll try the ocean. Came there, jumped in the Pacific Ocean. I fell in love. And I didn't look back. But it's like such an unexpected twist and journey. When I got there, where I ended up was HKS. And Saif's like, he was in my head the whole time, just thinking about, gosh, should I do this? Should I do this? So I started, I was like, all right, I'll learn how to put a building together uh, at HKS. And I started out with um, doing stair details and toilet partitions and like all the unglamorous side of our profession that they probably don't teach you about, except for a couple uh, individuals in here. You have to do that stuff. That's, they're part of buildings. They're part of architecture. Um, but while I was there, a project came in the door. And it was this one. So I'm a, any sports fans in the room? A couple. You don't have to be a sports fan, but I'm, I'm speaking to you right now. Was I am a diehard Cowboys fan. Born and raised, the Cowboys were my team. Next year, they're going to win the Super Bowl. Whoever, next year. Next year. I promise you. So this project came to the door. And I'm in Los Angeles. And just serendipitously, the design of the Cowboy Stadium walked in there. And now this wasn't my job. I was telling this story at lunch. Um, my day job was stair details and toilet partitions. But after hours, I went over to the side of the studio that was working on this project. I embedded myself in that culture. I worked after hours till 2 a.m., 12 p.m., Saturday, Sunday, to be involved in this project. <laughs> Until one day I got called to the principal's office Literally, the principal of the firm came in there. He's like, Lance, what are you doing? You know, you're working till 2, 3 in the morning. You're working on your weekends. And I was like, I want to do that. That's my team. I want to shape that. And he's like, well, you know, you could just do that. You don't have to, like, waste, stay up till 2 a.m. You don't have to work your weekends to do it. And I was like, really? I can just do that? He's like, yeah, if that's where your passion is. So just do it. So I did. I just did it. And I never looked back. So the point there is follow your passion here. And now I see uh, Professor Bulinx at the back and she was my thesis advisor, our thesis professor in the in studio. And again, I think you liked my project. I think it was okay. It's, well, I don't know, maybe not. But the, uh, and at the end of it, I was also doing furniture design. Do you guys still do furniture class here at Tech? Yeah, well, I was there. I was doing the same, like both concurrently. And I put all my heart and my soul into the thesis class. And I kind of phoned it in on the furniture class. And I never met, like, Professor Bulinks was so happy to see my thesis project. And I saw her in this elevator lobby. I'll never forget it. And she's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, well, I'm going to go display my piece of furniture in the library. And she got so excited. She's like, oh, yeah, tell me all about it. So I started telling her about it, get excited. And then I got nervous because I knew I'd phoned it in. And we got up to the library. I'll never forget the look on your face when you saw that piece of furniture and you were like, you shook your head. And you're like, you like that? Yeah. And I've never been like, oh, I just was made her so disappointed in the work. Everything you do matters. And that's what you taught me. 
So it's, the story today is going to be about two stadiums, uh, U.S. Bank Stadium uh, and SoFi Stadium, two of the projects that I was fortunate enough to help lead. And we'll start with Minnesota. This was the stadium in Minnesota before we got started. It's called the Metrodome. Anybody remember the Metrodome in lower? Yeah. Inflatable roof structure. It collapsed in a snowstorm and they needed to build a new one. HKS got invited to a competition. There was uh, eight, I think eight notable firms throughout. We all did designs for this, interviewed with the team and the city of Minneapolis, the state government. Um, these are HKS's proposals uh, in the interview. So the one on the left, uh, one on the right was the one that we let out of the LA studio. And the one on the left was actually led by another Texas Tech grad, Heath May. So Heath runs our line studio at HKS now. And ironically, he sits right next to me in Los Angeles now. He was in Texas. He moved to LA. And in my little small world I'm in, two Texas Tech grads from the same year sitting right next to each other in Los Angeles. Well, that's where we started. It was about exploration, about how to connect to a city. It was about transparency. It was about almost everything opposite of what that first image you saw, which was closed and uninviting. This was one about community. In the end, we got selected to be the architect, not because of the images that you see on the wall. And while like, we think that they're pretty cool, it wasn't about that. It was the way that we talked about the architecture. It was the way that we talked about community and how we'd embrace it, how we'd de define a new design language together. So the Project Gibbons uh, is in Minnesota. So one, state team. Two, it was for Minneapolis and St. Paul, the Twin Cities. It was for the Vikings. The Metrodome, they called Minneapolis's living room. So in the winter months, it is cold as all can be. And people use that building to go walk their dogs, roller skate, watch a movie. That all happens in that building. So it needed to be built for the community and one that was that community was really woven into the experience of it. And yes, when we're designing sports facilities, we got to design for these guys. You know, it's got to be about the fanatic, hardcore, loud, energetic, atmospheric, but it also has to be about these people too. These aren't just objects in a city. These are parts of a community. Some of the largest pieces of architecture a community is going to build. And so we have a great responsibility uh, to the social aspect of what we do and how we do it. Minnesota, like a lot of places in the United States, is actually a melting pot of different cultures from around the world. Also has a great architectural fabric in the city. And you guys probably recognize a lot of the architecture that I'm showing here on the wall. So a lot of inspiration in around the local context. The Guthrie down there from John Nouvelle is our neighbor and has rich and a geological identity of the city. So the St. Anthony River, right, our St. Anthony Falls over there has these wonderful ice formations that happen uh, in the wintertime, this jagged formation of, of, of the ice that is so beautiful. And then going back to the Scandinavian uh, uh, notion and inspiration, not only from the team, but the descendants from the region. So all those kind of worked in concert for us as inspiration. We came out with this idea of authenticity for that stadium, what it could be. In the end, it was about craft and value. You know, we wanted the stadium to be responsive to the climate of the place, not fighting against it. We wanted the interior volume and shape to be filled with light in a way that was kind of opposing what they thought they knew about a stadium. So coming here to the, uh, the idea of responsibility, this is uh, downtown Minneapolis over here, the CBD, east uh, over here where the stadium was. This was the old Metrodome site. It was really derelict part of Minneapolis uh, when we started here. But it had this great potential to connect communities from the Elliott Park neighborhood up to the Guthrie you see at the top of the, of the page there and into the sports district, which is over there where the Minnesota Twins play baseball on the other end of the, of the, of the city. So we had this great opportunity with the stadium to be this nexus of, of situation. It's also situated right on the light rail line. So you think about uh, mass transportation to get to a stadium, the idea of, you know, this project for a stadium only has 200 and something parking spaces on site. Like, get your head around that. 60,000 plus seats, 200 parking spaces. You can do an urban stadium and have it highly functional. 
but it works because it's also connected to how Minnesotans use downtown. So they have these little gerbil tubes, they're called skyways. They're glass bridges elevated from the street. Has anybody been to Minneapolis in the room? You know, some people, it's so bizarre. Like the city is up on, in that skyway, shopping malls, restaurants, all elevated from the street and they come together. So we connected it to the, the skyway system and we presented this to the city of Minneapolis in the Guthrie. This got like a standing ovation. They're like, oh, connected to the skyway. They're like, yeah, did something right. Um, the form of the building for us is more just than a architectural, you know, kind of making. You know, it's about creating an authentic response to where we are. So the climate drove the form. The brand of the team drove the form. The idea of sustainability in a true way drove the form and the civic response we talked about. So in Minneapolis, you have to design for extremes. Same space, different times. Uh, this idea of the winter is the dominant, dominant force. So we came up with this rule. Number one rule, get the snow off the roof. We use different language in the in the presentations, but that's kind of the gist of it. So one, what would happen? So if you take a, a typical volume with a, a shallow roof form, all the snow accumulates on the, on the roof and it causes a high premium in the structural steel of the building. So if we just did something simple, you know, they've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years, which was pitch the roof to shed the snow off of the roof. You could actually save quite a bit of dollars as it relates to steel investment in the building but it also starts to create the identity of the architecture itself. We took it one step further and we shifted the axis asymmetrically, the ridge line. So we wanted more of the south sun coming into the stadium, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Ta-da, the north sun, that's the light that you want. The south sun is really what we were after. We were after the warmth in the football season. We wanted to capture that energy. And then when we shifted it, we actually made the north side of the roof steeper. So as it was darker, it needed a steeper roof to shed the snow off. So again, working together. And then we pointed this thing, we started to massage the form of the city to respond to the city itself. And then the final element was, we put the system of uh, snow catchment basins around the perimeter of the roof. In the end, it created a pretty dynamic response about an architecture of a stadium, what it could be in a city. One about transparency, one about creating its own brand, one that was sympathetic to the city, one that could be, you know, I don't know if it's understood, but it could be respected. The way in which we defined the pitch of the roof, the geometry of the roof was really a collaborative effort. This is all rhino and grasshopper driven with our structural engineers and mechanical engineers together. And so we defined this uh, idea where the height of the roof and the pitch was optimized, or if it was one foot higher, it would cause a premium on the design. If the angle was one degree less, it would cause a premium on the design. So you got to see that. And then at the end of the day, almost uh, over a million cubic feet of snow around it. And you're like, oh man, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's like a lot of snow, a million cubic feet. These are these basins over here. You can start to see the treads and risers of the stadium here and the catch basement around the perimeter, but still maybe not make sense. So you put a scale figure in here and you start to see the size of, of these snow basins and the amount of it. You know, like four story buildings up to catch the snow off, off the roof. These fences right here were called impact fences. They were designed to resist the force of uh, like a freeway barrier with a semi truck from sh uh, ice shedding off the roof. They had to withstand that and angle it down into the basin itself. So a lot of complex engineering that went into really a simple idea of getting the snow off the roof. So what happens to it? We angled the prow of the stadium up. We're almost welcoming the, the downtown core. We like that gesture of the CBD. It points right to it. It becomes this reflective uh, nature in the city. Um, but it's also one from the public side and the public realm. What we did is we created a place, an outdoor room for the stadium here. We and it inflected the geometry around the seating bowl to create plazas on the outside. Well, for us, they're all about ceremony and pregame and function. So the outdoor room became almost just as important as the indoor room itself in the design of, of the stadium. And from the materiality, the use of a clean and simple material palette. 
you know, reflective glass that comes back and it reflects this back on the city itself. So when you're looking at this building, you're seeing the downtown core, what it's gesturing towards. Um, the brief, the original one was for a retractable roof stadium. And we had a different idea about how to handle connection, but we want, we wanted to embrace the kind of the great so, uh, shoulder months of Minneapolis. And so how do we do that? We created this idea of dissolving the wall, that big vertical wall. He said, we designed five pivot doors uh, into action. The tallest one is 95 feet tall. So 95 by 55, and they step down in their presence. So these doors uh, pivot on a cantilever. When they're in their closed position, it has that seamless uh, facade and reflection of the city. But when you open it, the city is allowed to come in. The fans are allowed to come in. The air is allowed to come in. All of this is on a, uh, a cantilever. So on this post, the doors are actually cantilevered out. So you can see they're floating uh, above the, the ground plane there, which is kind of a, a feat of engineering in and of itself. But we had to slope the, the ground away from the door, right? To let the water away. But it also has man doors in there. So when the doors are closed, you can come to the stadium too. So a lot of complex engineering and thought goes into the idea of connection in place. But a dynamic response when you're in this stadium of how it feels and its presence is undeniable when you come in there. It makes a statement uh, to the city and, and for the city. At night, it transforms into this glowing box. The Metrodome, you could never tell what was happening in this building. You didn't know. Here, this stadium screams the event that's happening at night. Um, when Prince passed away, this building glowed purple for a week. And it was this beautiful response to an artist for architecture. You can start to see the transformation on the inside, the way natural light floods through the building. At night on Monday Night Football, you can see it projected through the ETFE membrane, the clear roof membrane or from the blow. And then they had this idea, the valor horn, the thing that the Vikings blow when they come out on the field. So before they would wheel this out on, on a pedestal pregame on the field. And do it. So we thought it'd be kind of cool if we gave it a place in the building of its stance. So we hung it from this giant truss over there. Oh, let's see if I can jump to point to it. Oh, right by the video board is where this horn is. And it becomes part of the ceremony of the game. So the, the steward of the game gets up and it's a big, a big party and show and they get to blow the horn and fire starts. They actually figured out how to make it snow inside the stadium too. It's pretty wild. Um, but I love the idea of how architecture can start a conversation with a city. You know, I think when, uh, when we presented this, the front page of the paper said big, bold, and glassy. What are we going to do with this? And it was kind of great. You know, I think the architecture for, for us in our studio, it's one about imagination. Can it capture the imagination? Can it make people question what it is? I don't think everybody's going to like what they see, but everybody should want to understand how it's made and how it collaborates. I think these are, uh, I tried to, uh, I couldn't figure this out, but I tried to do the entire presentation through the view of the public realm and Instagram. It's like fascinating when you just type in your buildings and see how people take pictures of them. I couldn't figure out how to get video into PowerPoint. I don't know, maybe you can help me next time. So moving on to sustainability, I mentioned that the, uh, the Vikings wanted a retractable roof. And so instead of doing a retractable roof, which, you know, start back from the Cowboys time, um, you know, they have a retractable roof and it's open maybe one or two times a year. It's like really what you want is connection. You want the natural light, the visibility. You want it to feel like it's outdoors. And so we proposed an ETFE roof and became that the new retractable. Saved a lot of money for the client and gave them a stadium result that they were really after. And I think if you see a game like this on TV, you wouldn't know that it's an indoor stadium. The structural design here was all about efficiency. We have one primary truss uh, coming across the ridge line uh, to it. It saved about 20% on the overall steel tonnage of the building uh, and allowed for a really elegant structural solution that worked with the form and the language of the stadium. From an energy standpoint, we actually use that volume that we created, the loft inside the space, you know, hot air rises is what it wants to do. So we're like, how are we going to use that to our benefit? 
So we have two modes that the stadium can go in. In winter mode, that heat is collected in the reservoir in the loft of that roof. There's ducts that run in that, the ridge of the truss, collects that hot air, and it's redistributed down to the lower ends of the stadium. You don't have to run heat in the stadium in the winter. It makes its own. It makes its own. In the summertime, you switch that. So hot air rises. How can you use that to your benefit? It's about air movement. You let it out. We have exhaust uh, louvers around the perimeter and at the peaks of the roof. They let that air out. It promotes movement in the building. It acts as a great reduction in the overall systems, building systems of the stadium. True sustainability as it relates to building form. Um, when you look at it from a public side of things, this idea of how it fit in, we actually proposed a four and a half acre public park next to the stadium as a give back to the community. It's something that would drive development and spurn. This was once a parking lot. It was a derelict parking lot and transformed into a city. Inside the stadium, it's full of unique spaces that we call invented product, but we're always like, well, how do you want to watch a game? It's like, well, I'd rather sit on a couch. Well, let's put some couches in the stadium. Oh, cool. Let's do that. And so we did. The stadium is kind of interesting as it relates to how we're trying to connect people to the game, give them unparalleled access to the field, the athletes as they come into the game. We invented this idea of a tunnel club for the Cowboys. Maybe you've seen it with a big star on the, on the ceiling and Jason Witten and Troy Aikman. They should go through that space. Not Troy Aikman, but probably Tony Romo. Get my, get my generation right. But full of spaces that make you feel like you're a part of the action in the team. And again, architecture that has to be quite different. These are hospitality-driven spaces, but they should be complementary to what's happening with the building form. And so you'll see that out. And so I start again with this Rick Rubin because he's just in my head these days. Uh, I love it. You know, because I showed you two images of what we thought the stadium was when we started this competition. And the end of the result was quite a bit different. But we still feel such pride and ownership of that because of the journey it went on. So next, we'll talk about the story of SoFi in LA. Um, this one was near and dear to my heart. I live about two miles away from this building. So it was like right in my backyard. Uh, for us here, it was all about creating authentic Los Angeles expression. How could we, the brief from the client was, could you create a stadium that could capture the imagination of the world in the entertainment cap capital of the world? provide an architecture that feels like Los Angeles and provide one that maybe the world hasn't seen. I was like, whoa, like quite a daunting brief uh, from a client. But it was one a great inspiration for us. And we look back to the region. Again, this idea of the beautiful landscape of Southern California, what drove me to the ocean was that beauty, the purity, the calmness of the waves and, of waves and the coastline. Um, so this design, it was twice as big as the one I just showed you in Minneapolis. This is 3 million square feet of stadium. Minneapolis is around 1.6 million square feet. This was always designed for two teams. It was the Chargers and the Rams. Rams first, the Chargers came on second. Um, but it was so much more than just a stadium. It's a 6,000 seat performance venue, a two and a half acre covered plaza, and then the stadium itself, 70,000 seat stadium, all centered around a beautiful lake in the middle. And I come back to this word community and responsibility of what it is. So when we were looking in the research, what used to be there was this. It was a racetrack, Hollywood Park racetrack. And anybody familiar with the city of Inglewood in the room? One, two. I mean, the rap song gives you some indication of it, but it's so much more than what it was. But the unfortunate thing is, this was the largest accessible green space that the city had was the inside lawn of this race racetrack so it wasn't just a racetrack for the community this is where they had weddings this is where they had boy scout troop functions this is where they had birthday parties and so for us when we started designing about this you know i think and we had some designs that did this we put the stadium in the center of the site but that's not really what was important to the site the public realm was the important thing. The heart of our site in SoFi is the public realm. It's Lake Park. It's the give back to the community. It's that thing that is making it embedded into the place that it's at. 
It also has this crazy location. We're right in between the two runways at Los Angeles. So like 30 million people fly over this site annually right in between the stadium. And so we started to design this for the fifth elevation is what we started to call it in the studio itself. How could we make this building instantly recognizable from the air in a clean way that people could just get it in the two or three seconds they could see it out their window? But it also had a functional requirement, which was crazy, which was if we built the stadium that we just showed you, a seating bowl like we did in Minneapolis, uh, about 100 feet of it would be above the FAA height limit in the site. So we knew from the beginning we had to go down into the ground. We called it embedding the stadium into the ground. So it went down 100 feet into the ground, excavated. Um, then another question we always get is why does this stadium have a canopy of protection you know it's beautiful weather out there all the time for us yes it acts as a guarantee but it also acts as a mediator in the environment like how many of you guys have been to a hot day game at jones at&t and you're just blasting in the sun you're like man i am so jealous of those people in the shade i want to sit over there so this roof creates equality in the seating bowl it has a 50% frit on its clear membrane that diffuses all the bad qualities of the natural light that's coming into the building. So you could be directly in the sunny side of the stadium and feel just the same if you were on the shady side. Um, the form itself was inspired by the, the imagery that I said at the beginning, the coastline of the sweeping forms, the energy of the city itself, uh, and the way that we sculpted the identity of the object. And then because we have an active fault line on our site too, which is probably the other uh, huge constraint. What we did is we anchored that roof form down into the ground in four distinct locations. I'll, work, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that, but it helps over its lateral stability. Uh, then looking back at some of the history of architecture using colonnade and rhythm as a way to have this link between the future and the past. Uh, and then the build, building on the identities that we created in Minneapolis about uh, passive design strategies, implementing that to the next degree here in, in LA, and then the synergies between the different programs. You can start to see here on the floor plan, this is the 6,000 seat performance venue. This is the covered plaza, American Airlines Plaza, and you see the stadium there, all under the monumental roof canopy. The plaza, American Airlines Plaza, was meant to be this uh, foreground, the pre-function space for the stadium and for the theater. You can start to see it on game day. This is how the Rams use it on game day. So you can see it filters individuals in and out of the building, becomes like this maze and labyrinth of, of energy, pre-game, post-game, during the game. Being in the, in the space, you can get a sense of the scale, the volume, the natural light. The breeze that flows here through here is, is amazing to, to feel. And the sound is, is ridiculous uh, with the ETFE providing this great backdrop for the, for the noise of the event. But it's also really fantastic on non-event days. So this was for the Super Bowl this last year. They did the NFL Honors Show here. And this is this space, you know, you're looking out towards the west over here on this picture. The sunset was framed coming down. The glow of the, of the light kind of transformed the space. You have this link between inside and out, the architecture and space. And then as you're coming in, you know, I always remember going to, to my first sporting event with my father and walking into a, a stadium. Then it was Texas Stadium and just feeling that little bit of awe and wonder about what's coming on here. And you can start to think about what this kid is thinking about as he's walking with his dad in throughout this space. The performance venue, YouTube Theater, again, was nestled under that canopy. Uh, almost, it was built almost like a ship in a bottle, I'll say. it. The roof canopy was in place, and we built the performance venue underneath. So 6,000 seats to host a range of things. It does boxings, comedy shows, concerts, uh, TED Talks high school graduations, you name it, it happens here and you can scale the room down. So from 6,000 seats down to 2,000 seats. That's a really utilitarian piece of the, of the project. It's quite uh, rewarding to see it in use. And then uh, we worked with a really 
fantastic landscape architecture firm, Mia Lair and Associates, uh, a brilliant thinker. She's a brilliant thinker as a way of, of how you can use landscape as a educational journey. So in Los Angeles, like within a one hour radius, one and a half hour radius, you have access to five distinct biomes. You can see on the top, the different biomes. So I always loved it when I got there, you know, you could go snow ski in the morning in Big Bear Mountain. And by the afternoon, I could be surfing the Pacific Ocean. I like just think about that. It was so cool to me uh, to be in a place like that. So the landscape in and around the stadium acts as that educational journey of the context in the area. So as you walk around it, each elevation represents a different biome of the city and integrated into the building. Um, we also, in LA, it's a desert. Water management is important to us. So we collect all of the water on the site. It gets uh, diverted back to the lake and the lake actually filters that water for reuse throughout the site. We also, we capture all the water that's collected on our roof and giant cisterns underneath the, the structure of the stadium for reuse. And you can start to see the public realm of the building uh, pregame here. But this is all open to the public, accessible. You know, it's for them to create these kind of spaces. I love the tailgate right there is my favorite spot on this space overlooking the lake in through Champions Plaza, the energy of this, the sunset at night is quite magical, the way it reflects off the materials of the building. And the landscape you see just creates these wonderful moments around this stadium that make you question kind of where you are and what you're seeing from the desert landscape to the lush greenery you just saw to a really, really robust tailgate culture on game day. The roof forms really become one with the landscape for us. They dance in and out. You know, one of the coolest stories I heard was from, uh, it was Jared Golf, poor guy. But uh, he was there, he was going to practice. It was like one of the first uh, games or practices he had at the building. He was like just getting ready. He was looking to the north and he was like, down to And he got back and he stopped. And he was like, uh, there's a palm tree coming down into the stadium. He stopped practice. He was like, is that supposed to be there? I was like, yeah, man, it's supposed to be there. It's about changing people's questions, making people pause. People that don't really know and respect the, the environment and the people who craft it, about creating a little bit of those moments that make them think, huh, why'd they do that? How'd they do that? Uh, the entry into the building, each one of them is, is designed uniquely uh, into those different landscapes and biomes. You can start to see how the roof touches down. Uh, to the ground, the shell wrapping around the entryway here. You know, in a normal stadium, when you come into the entry, you're divorced from the playing surface, like cut away from the energy of the action. We want to do the opposite. As soon as you walk through that threshold, we want you connected to the sound, the energy, the noise of the game. We want you to see it. So as you come into the stadium, you look right down onto the playing surface as you're coming into the building. Each concourse offers something unique. This is the upper concourse at SoFi. It's one of my, I think, most favorite spaces in the building. It has this elevated view of Los Angeles, the Hollywood sign. You can see the coastline. You get this great vista and sunset. You have these awesome, we call them standing room only party platforms, gathering spaces that allow the fans and the access to expand based on the event. Go from 70,000 people to 100,000 people in the stadium. Magical kind of moments right next to the roof the way that the environment, you start to see the landscape work its way down into the building. It's really important for us that, you know, you're going down a hundred feet into the ground that you didn't feel like you were going into a tunnel. You know, we wanted that landscape to go down this journey with you. So we brought them into the spaces, into the building. So they actually show up on your way to your suite, to your seat, to your club environment. You can escape the connection between the landscape and the built form of the building. The architecture of the shell is comprised really of two main materials. The metal here is a, it was a custom metal invented by Zayner out of uh, Kansas City, Missouri for us, called white titanium aluminum or white anodized aluminum, which was basically just aluminum dipped in titanium. And what we wanted it to do is we wanted it to appear bright white in the sun but we wanted it to reflect all the beautiful hues of the sunset and sunrise throughout the region. So we worked with him. They uh, installed these in mega panels. So this was, um, this was all created in 
rhino and grasshopper. And for us, like going to a stadium, each time you go there, it's unique. You know, each experience is unique. There's not one game that's the same as the previous one. And so we wanted the individuals to be bathed in a palette of light that would be ever-changing to reflect that uniqueness of the event day. You can never recreate opening day at this stadium. The light will never look the same way in the stadium. That's what we did with this process. It was uh, developed in Rhino Grasshopper again. Um, 35,000 uniquely perforated triangles with no premium. Uh, this was digitally delivered. So straight from a Rhino script to the manufacturer, actually through an Excel spreadsheet, straight to the machine and delivered on to site without seeing ever seeing a piece of paper. It was stamped digitally, it's created digitally, and it was built digitally. The quality of light that you see coming through this uh, is quite beautiful. We've been told that it has some of the most successful lighting apertures of any professional venue that photographers have been in and the way it captures uh, the light, the energy. I love seeing the shadowing on the columns as you walk by and the way it reflects the time of day and the energy of it. Here at sunset, you can start to see the, hue, the hues of the, the sky change, our connections and framed openings back to the city uh, and beyond. At night, it inverts. Uh, so we have this ever-changing uh, LED system of light behind the panel. So in the daytime, the light emits. At nighttime, it emits light itself. Uh, and this system is tied into the video board technology in the stadium, so it can pulse. It lives and breathes with the game. You know, the energy of the game, you score a touchdown, the skin goes wild. You know, it's about a way of communication to the city. And you start to see, this was a mock-up that we did about reflection. And sun, this was sunrise, but then how it can change throughout the night to test our proof of concept. Did we do it right? I don't know. The, uh, it looked out, you know, we did, I think, a pretty cool job. The client came up to us and he's like, ah, you aren't lying. That first sunset that happened, and that was so rewarding to hear. Um, the last little piece of information here before I let you guys go was about the seismic response. This is the fault line that's coming through our site. That was the racetrack that I showed you guys in the beginning. So how are we going to respond to an active fault line with this giant stadium, this big roof coming through? And so our solution was to separate the stadium from the roof itself. And you can see that blue line that we have encircling around it. That was our seismic moat. So it is 100 foot deep. 12 foot wide moat around the entire perimeter of the building lets the stadium bowl move independently from the earth when it moves. So the roof would be moving and the bowl would stay in place or vice versa. On top of each one of the structural columns uh, that we have around the building, they have a, a seismic isolator on top of that. And then the roof sits on top of those. And so it allows that movement to happen. This is a cross section through the 50 yard line coming through the different spaces into the stadium but you can see that isolation area here and how the stadium can move this is actually one of these guys in action so you can see the type of movement that we're talking about in the building what it has uh, to accommodate the flexibility on, on a on a seismic event that's pretty trippy huh so crazy and you can see these in action so and uh, this is the top of the roof column here. This is one of the abutments of the stadium in the center that has those isolators in place, but they're seamlessly blended into the architecture response. I actually think they add uh, to the character of the space. So that's that abutment in the middle coming down into a cast steel uh, abutment, a singular cast steel abutment. You start to see the quality of light coming into the building. The colonnade on the, on the backside, a really beautiful, I think more restrained response for the architecture. The sweeping curve line of the roof is uh, complemented by the rhythm of the columns and those isolators are blended in at the top. The south end of the stadium at the, at the tip of the building, it has its unique purpose. You know, it almost looks like it's floating in air. There's that tension that's created uh, through it. The passive ventilation strategy was one that was huge for us. We wanted it to feel like it was outdoors. Uh, so the entire seating bowl is, every concourse is lifted. So you get the cross ventilation from west to east through the building, goes through it. And then on the roof, there's a series of operable panels that were added to the roof, almost like numbers on the face of a clock. And those can open and close based on ambient temperature, direction of the wind, um, time of day, month, really kind of simple 
movement that allows for them to tune the building. You see that in the inside of, of the stadium, the quality of light that's filtered through. You can see the verticality of the embedded object, the connection between the outside is prevalent, unique concourses and spaces inside the stadium that are dynamic and unique places to watch a game, getting fans again as close to the action as they possibly can uh, to the players into the field and offer them something unique. You know, this is uh, the affinity board. So learning off what we did for AT&T, which is a center hung video board, how could we create the next version of that for digital immersion? So two sided elliptical board, it's the entire width and length of the football field itself. It really captures the energy of the game day. It doesn't demand your attention. You know, you're not distracted from the field, but it definitely amplifies the space and time. You know, whether it be on a Super Bowl or a normal day, this idea is it becomes part of the show. It's another actor in the play. The players love it. The energy around it is pretty fantastic. And the last little piece here is we also did the same thing on the roof. So we embedded LED modules at five feet on center on the roof itself in the clear bathroom. You can't see, it doesn't take away from anything on the inside, but it's turned the roof of the stadium to this giant billboard for Los Angeles. This is where the city of LA uh, expressed its remorse when Tommy Lasorda passed away. It's how it congratulated the Lakers on their championship, the Dodgers for their championship. It's how they said, welcome to the world, the stones are coming here. This is really becoming this great uh, use of multifunction technology into the building. And then this is just a time-lapse uh, construction shot, just so you can get a sense about what it took to build and get this thing out of the ground. So all of this that you're seeing is buried. You know, so just think about all of the structural infrastructure in and around the building uh, that no one is ever going to see as a response. The roof, just like the perforated panels were built in sections, the primary steel of the building was also digitally delivered and it was erected in mega panels up. It was the largest crane in the, in the world used to erect these pieces into place in different picks um, throughout. Going into the building, they're laying over the cable netting for the truss, the two-way cable system. It's a very lightweight structural system. Actually, it's so lightweight that we needed that video board to hold the roof down. It acts as a ballast for the roof itself. The metal panels come into effect. You start to see the quality of light throughout the day. Video board coming on. And that's it. So thank you guys. What a trip. This was so cool. Seeing everybody's faces in here as you we were talking. Well, wow. Lance, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, yeah. I'll invite you to the yeah. front. Q&A session. Um, at this time, we'd like to open it up to questions to the audience. I have some questions prepared, but I'm sure from that presentation, there, I imagine there'll be questions from the audience as well, too. Uh, let's see. Uh, when Lance was talking about 100 feet deep, Jones Stadium, the top of the seating bowl is 50 feet tall. So it's twice as deep as Jones Stadium is tall. Just, and by the way, your shoes are great. Yeah, thank you. I don't go anywhere without my Chuck Taylors. The, um, the, the excavation project for the stadium took almost a year to dig the hole. And the site is 300 acres long. It's larger than Disneyland. Give you a perspective of that. We rose the entire site 12 feet. We didn't export any dirt from the site. So that entire 300 acres was elevated 12 feet. This gives you a sense of, of the magnitude of excavation. Other questions, comments? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Lance, for this great presentation. And I uh, <laughs> just need to share this with the uh, whole audience. But I happen to see, because of family ties, your first stadium in Minnesota before I knew it was designed by him. And of all things, you know, what happened actually is uh, it's my relatives who lived there for the entire time my father-in-law is from there and what happened is actually it's like oh we let's go to the stadium they designed this great thing you can it's, it's all these other things but football and literally that's what we did so you went to see the hall of fame of the uh, vikings and you know they haven't won a super bowl those of you <laughs> who know that so that connection to the city really is exactly what he talked about it which actually worked without me knowing that was the intent. So I wanted to give that back to you, but I also want to ask the question, um, uh, heading out from here, from Texas Tech, and you know, you mentioned various experiences, but you also mentioned that, that you were very early on interested into stadiums, but that moment, you know, maybe sort of leaving a place which isn't as large, you're from San Antonio, they, they have a fast, uh, fabulous basketball team, uh, but what could you give to our students, you know, if they feel maybe similar, you know, like they could be in your role in 20 years, you know, I think there's something like that. So what do you have for our students and how about the connection of, because I think that's both there and the other thing I'd still say, I know it's a lot, but I also flew in and I knew you did the stadium and I saw it right away. Exactly a year ago, I flew in in February to, to LA and that's what I saw. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Upe. It's pretty cool when uh, you get to hear your family and your friends and like experience your work and like go there and test it out and see if you're if <laughs> what you wanted to do was a, was a reality. Um, for me, my I look at you guys with some jealousy too because I wish I was just starting my career twenty years you know ago and with all of the tools that we have at our fingertips about the advancement of our profession. I think it's going to be profound in, in your lifetime as, as architects, what it means to be an architect, how you practice architecture. Um, so first, I would say embrace the times. Embrace it. Architecture is a culture. You, know, you have to live it to, I think, make a successful career out of it. Um, I also think you don't have to be asked to do anything. And that's the other thing is like, you know, some of us are introverts and some of us are extroverts, uh, but we can all talk with our pen and the power of our designs is really what matters in the world. So be, be powerful with your voice that, that you're given this voice of creativity. And, you know, if you don't like the way something is, take it, take it, take a chance to nothing bad happens when you take a chance. I think we in, have a question over here. Um, hi, um, I think you did an amazing um, speech. I really loved it. As someone who is going to enter the work field and you know, they always ask you like, oh, what do you, you know, what field do you want to get into? Hospitality, commercial, residential? You talked about all of these stadiums and like how you guys tackled each issue or like how you guys wanted to connect it, but you didn't really explain like why you went into the sports and entertainment field. And I really love to hear um, kind of a little bit of your story or just what interests you about it. No, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, for, you know, I didn't want to be a stadium designer when I, when I got out, you know, I wanted to do a little bit of everything. You know, I wanted to do a high rise. I still do. Uh, I wanted to do a hospital. I wanted to do a hotel. I wanted to do this, that, and the other. I think what my career evolved into a place where I found camaraderie in the idea. Like, and, and so I think it was more the ideas around stadiums that, that I gravitated towards. So if I had some um, advice, I would say that like, follow, follow your creative voice into the best place for you. And it could be a designer of many things, or it could be a designer of a few things. But for me, stadiums, uh, they've evolved into less about architecture, which I know they are, but they're more inventions to me. Each one is bespoke to the place and the city and the team and the energy and the time and technology was used to create. So every one of these for me 
is a chance to do something the world hasn't seen before or our studio hasn't seen before or, or like invent something that hopefully improves the way people experience the public realm and public gathering and entertainment and sport and hopefully makes it a little bit more fun. Um, we don't replicate anything in our work. You know, we don't have a toolkit of seating bowls or skins or anything. It's all new and fresh. And that's what's kept me excited. I think uh, I probably told my boss this, you know, I've tried to quit HKS like three times in my career. Uh, and each time the company has reinvented itself along the way. So, you know, it's a, I think, find a place that will evolve with you as you evolve. I guess I should stand, huh? So I could probably speak for a lot of us uh, when I say there's a lot of us here that probably want to be in a position like you are to be a part of these giant projects that can really impact and affect so many people. With students that are coming into the work field, what are you looking for in people like us to join your team and be able to actually help with these things? Mm. I'd say two two things for for. Uh... Me and I, and I have to say that I've, I've been blessed with a lot of great mentors in my career. Um, you know, Upe, Mario Bota was, was yours, right? As a, and I, I always remember that being profound for me. Maybe you don't know the names of the individuals that I'm going to say, but, you know, Mike Rogers was the head of the studio in Los Angeles when I came there. It was his design for, for Cowboys, really. Uh, but the one thing that he really taught me is uh, voice is equal. And the room, the big room that it takes to create this work full of hundreds of collaborators, um, we're all equal in that room. And we're looking for the best idea, not who had the best idea. And so I think from young graduates, what inspires me personally are people that surprise me and put something on the wall that was unexpected. And it's hard to do as a person coming right out of school, you know, you want to impress, you don't want to make a mistake. You know, you're, you're like scared to ask questions and nervous about, about finding your voice. Um, and that's our job. I think as as leaders of studio is to create a comfortable space where people feel uh, open to that kind of radical, I'll call it radical collaboration is what it's looking for. So I think as soon as fast as you feel comfortable stepping into that world, the better it's going to be for your career. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's it's not all, only been clear for my eyes to understand the the projects you have made, but it, it was also impressive to see the amount of techniques and work it's being implemented in those projects. But what I really want to know is the development of the technology that you learned in these projects. Have you um, learned how to implement those new technologies on those stadiums or has it been a process to learn as you create these projects in the stadium like that? You mentioned the, the screening on, on the roof. Mm -hmm. I think that was a really impressive uh, feature that was on there. And it, I've, it's also something that I've wondered as well when I'm learning architecture is how much technology is there to implement in, in the major? And so I was wondering how much did you learn when you're making those projects and uh, what are ways to learn about all the new technologies that keeps happening in the world? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're gonna stay relevant in our field, you have to stay curious. And that's, that's what I'll say. It's a constant, constant uh, search for the now and a look towards what the future is. So the technology for us, um, as you see it on the screen, there was a lot of stuff that, we, that I threw at you today. The idea of the digital delivery of the metal panel, um, we knew that the, the design that we came up with was so geometrically complex that you couldn't rationalize it in traditional uh, building, the way architecture is traditionally handled, it would have taken you know, nine volumes of 12,000 pieces of paper to do it. So uh, we have a group inside of HKS called Line. It's actually headed by a co-graduate of mine, Heath May. 
and his studio invented this technology uh, to release a architecturally sealed and stamped drawing to the state of California. Um, and it's legally stamped digitally and you can't mess with it. And it was something that was created because of the design. We didn't seek out the technology. It was because of what the design uh, gave us. We knew on the, the one you mentioned for the turning the roof into a large television screen, we knew we wanted to create an identity for the city itself. And we started just talking <laughs> like, how cool would it be? I'll never forget though. We had, um, it was a Super Bowl halftime show that Bruno Mars played. And I was like, oh, how cool would it be to have Bruno Mars like on the roof, you know, but giant Bruno Mars. And the, we were like, well, how can we do that? And it just started a conversation we're like, all right, well, let's go talk to the guy who, the firm that makes LED pucks. We did that. And then let's go talk to the people that make the material for the roof, the ETFE. And then let's get them in the room together and show them this image of Bruno Mars on the roof of SoFi and say like, how can we make this a reality? So it's all about it, like a start of idea and then trying to connect the dots as best you can with the network in our field, which is the creative industry, which is full of people way smarter than me <laughs> that know how to get these things done. And that's when the magic happens. Like when the, the collaboration, I said radical collaboration, that's you know, internal to architects, but also the field of architecture, engineering, uh, and the arts in general. When you saw, uh, thought, or introduced to us uh, Rick Rubin, yes. you mentioned the word communication shortly there also. Can, can you talk to us about uh, communication and how you think how important that is? Because with technology evolving, right? You just mentioned the first board with was famous that the Dallas Cowboys yes. did it in football. And now that seems almost the side of it. So communication and evolving technology, you know, how do we tell our students what's what's the importance that we need to Yeah, I think the I don't think you can under understate the importance of communication in in your work, Upe. Um, Rick is a is a cool one for me just because of like, his trajectory of, the, of, of who like he has collaborated with in the music industry. And it's so, it's so dispersed and spread. There's not one style, you know, you couldn't say, Hey, he worked with rap artists or rock artists or country artists or folk artists. He works with musicians. And I think, um, I think communication allows us to do that. If you have an open mind about the communication and you don't come in with preconceived notions of what you're trying to achieve, and if you're open to listening, like Rick's, Rick's book, he, you know, he's talking about closing his eyes, you know, and he's like, people ask him what he does. And he's like, I don't, I'm just listening, you know? And I think sometimes we probably need to do a little bit more of that as, as architects and, and creators is just listen to the, to the noise that's happening and try to capture that magic when you can, Upe. And the, I think technology, you know, we've embraced it as a firm and as a studio, you know, we do, we do uh, research in AI and VR and AR, and I think we're interested in all of it, uh, but it's, it's to promote the forward notion of, of at least the conversation that our architecture is trying to have with, with the communities and with its in. So it's not, using, it's not using technology to use technology, but it's using technology to have, I, I think, hopefully the appropriate conversation. Okay. Yeah, so you How important is that they speak what they learn, how to present orally versus, oh, well, you know, make this great paper. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hugely important. I mean, I had, I, I had such a, I've had such a fortunate career. Um, you know, I, I said I started working on the Cowboys. I never got to really present to the Joneses. You know, I was always like in the anti room, pinning up drawings and running around the studio, and seeing them getting scurried in and out. But I did get the chance to work at Dodger Stadium in the renovation at Dodger Stadium. And under that, I got brought into the room with the, the ownership. And I don't know why, but they gave me an opportunity to present. One year out of school, I got to present a renovation <laughs> to the design of Dodger Stadium. And I was terrified. I was like mortified. You know, I was like, how am I gonna do this? I, I prepared, you know, to get myself comfortable. And I, I did as much as I could do it. And I got up there, Upe, and 
what happens, man? My voice cracks like right off the bat. And I was, and I was like, oh gosh, how are you going to get through this? Um, but it was the work on the wall was good. It was, it was good work that the studio had put together so I could present with conviction and the owner there, he was a great guy. Um, and I, I love the conversations he had about architecture and he saw the world in a cool place. And he, he gave me a little leeway um, to do it. And at the end of that meeting, I found my place and found my voice in that. And then I was still nervous for years, you know, and it was, I wasn't comfortable yet with the material. Uh, and you have to have a comfort with the material. Uh, and I have to forget this, I had a pleasure of um, doing some competition work in Iraq for some soccer stadiums. And we were doing competitions in Iraq and we were doing some in Paris, France. And I drew the straw to go to Iraq. So I flew to Iraq, you know, when the green zone was still in place and he got there and we stayed in the bunker in the airport and they put your flap jacket on on the way to the Ministry of Sport. And I'm sitting here and I got my note cards and I'm trying to like, you know, memorize what I'm gonna say. And I look up and there's like a 50 caliber machine gun like pointed right at me and i'm just like why am i nervous about these note cards it's like i don't know it just gave me a thing it was like forget about it and i haven't been nervous since i can't say that anybody's gonna replicate that story but it just made me think of it um but i'd say it's comfort and material so repetition you know if it's not a natural thing for you it's about becoming comfortable i think we have one more time time for like one more from the audience and then the, maybe one or two from online that i'll read out is this thing on um, again, great, great speech. Um, love hearing about how passionate you are. I guess I'm curious as uh, people going into that, um, looking even further, you're a team leader and um, looking to see kind of what kind of strategies you implement. You mentioned there's hundreds of people in the room trying to make sure that, you know, some of those ideas, even if they are quiet or something, get picked up and get mm -hmm. noticed. And what can we do to be better at that? Yeah, it's, I think it's up, it's really up to you to not be bashful about putting content up to be discussed and debated. Um, I, it, for, for our studio, the, it's not about finding a, a solution. You find a lot of solutions. It's about finding the solution. And the only way we're gonna get to the solution is through iteration, at least in our, in our practice. And the only way that the studio people and the members of the team can contribute to that iteration is to iterate and is to produce. So even if you don't feel comfortable talking about your work, having your work on the wall, let others talk to you. They're inspired by some, something else. They see something that you don't. That's why we, we still in this virtual world, we pin up everything. We have living walls of architecture in our studios. Uh, and it's about that, you know, you might see something on the on the way to lunch or the way home that sparks your interest. So it's about getting stuff on the wall. Don't be worried about these, like finding the perfect thing. You know, that's what the collaboration is about, finding that perfect thing. You know, we're looking for the individuals to contribute ideas. I'm going to wrap by acknowledging some of the questions that are coming in from online. And they're both similar and they both touch on collaboration. So I'm going to kind of combine them into one. Uh, the first is from an anonymous attendee who asks, could you talk a little bit more about the portion of SoFi Stadium that went to optimizing sound and experience in a space that, of that size for concert stadium tours? And the second question is from Kevin Brown who asks, can you discuss the consulting engineers you worked with, how they contributed to the, to the design or perhaps some of the other stakeholders that drove the designs, so or maybe a few words about the collaboration to wrap things up for us. Yeah, um, the idea of, I, probably, I didn't say enough about it today. You know, these stadiums, they can't just be stadiums anymore. They have to be a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, one of those is for the music industry. These become the places that the artists want to come to. So, uh, SoFi was a, a great story in collaboration and sound optimization. Um, and we spent a lot of time with acousticians and sound engineers about how to optimize the flow of sound in and around the building. And I think it's why um, a lot of the artists have chosen to put their TV movie, film their TV movies there. Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour, uh, filmed their show at, at SoFi. Um, Beyonce is filming her show at SoFi. The Weeknd produced his at SoFi. BTS, the Korean band, uh, produced theirs at, at SoFi. Um, and it's about understanding what the artists want from sound and space. 
you know, they want a canvas that they can paint in. They don't want a without, they don't want a space without character. They like character. It's why like these great outdoor amphitheaters have so much uh, ambiance with them, the gorge or red rocks, you know, but our stadium tours have become like, you know, almost monochromatic in their definition. So I think the artists are appreciating the, the uniqueness that um, our designs are hopefully, hopefully adding to the landscape. Um, and then the, the idea of consultant collaboration, I think just building on the idea of internal collaboration, we want engineers that design and think like us, you know, and um, the engineer that helped on SoFi is Mark Wagner is his name. He works at Walter P. Moore. Uh, he's the kind of guy that is, I don't know if he's ever said no to me or the studio in that regards. And it could be the most harebrained idea, but it's like, ah, well, let's see. And so I think that's what we're interested for. We want people to push us um, as architects and designers, and we want engineers around us that can help us turn stadiums into machines for the environment like we did in Vikings or, or something pretty special about how to deal with seismic forces in, in LA or landscape architects that ask questions like, why does why does the plantscape have to stop at the fence line? Those are, those are all avenues that, that we like in, in the creative field. Oh, I think there was one more back. Oh, one more? One more. Okay. Maybe last one. Um, so you mentioned that the larger the project, the bigger the city impact. How can you make a large impact with a smaller scale project, like maybe a high school stadium, would you go about designing it the same way? Are you talking high school football in Texas or somewhere else? <laughs> the stadiums are pretty big. That's a, yeah, it's a religion. Um, our, pr our process doesn't change based off of the scale. I think our, que our questions are the same. Um, the immediate, I guess the broader impact of the larger work is just because of visibility. You know, but I think if you think about maximizing the visibility and the potential of your project, that's what we're after. And so if that audience is a small community, then that's who you're trying to, to reach and push a little bit further out of that. You know, and I think pushing boundaries with the work is, is probably what we're always trying to do. Um, we call it designing for the plus in the studio. We're like, it's this, but what else can it do? And I think if you end every meeting with with that it always pushes you to the next day and something different well lance on behalf of the college thank you so much that's yeah, truly fantastic i really appreciate it <laughs>